Uh, we have shown you what it's like in the 70s in Nashville. We have talked about the, the disappearance, the investigation, the transfer, the dismissal, some of the ethical issues raised as a part of all that. And now we're going to get down to what uh, I believe Sherman Dickens would call the hardcore part of homicide investigation. The person who's going to bring us the first phase of that is the aforementioned Doug Jones, who uh, has written a book on this subject. Many of you have probably read it. We use the book liberally in planning our program, and we appreciate the fact that he's going to come share some of his tidbits with you uh, about the investigations in the 1990s and the, the year uh, of the millennium, the next millennium, which led to a very different conclusion about all the facts you've just heard. Doug, come on up. So what really happened to Marsha Trimble? In 1974, the Tennessee Department of Corrections had an inmate, inmate number 73179, out here at the main, wall, main walls, the main penitentiary. Inmate 73179 was from Shelby County, Memphis. He was African American, he's about six foot three, tall, rangy. He's born in 1948, he graduated from Jeter High School in Memphis. As soon as he graduated from high school, he became the Memphis Police Department's number one suspect in a string of burglaries. And by the way, I move around a lot, but they've ordered me, the DA's office has ordered me to stay right back here. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be all over the place, and Thurman's threatened to put me in jail. But so this inmate 73179 becomes the prime suspect in a series of burglaries in Memphis, Tennessee. Somehow he dodges that, gets off that, and joins the Army, becomes a mechanic, takes training, becomes a mechanic on Cobra helicopters and does two tours in Vietnam. When he returns from Vietnam unemployed, he comes back to Memphis, and he becomes a backstreet prize fighter, fist fighter. And let me just say this, I'm not talking about when we were little guys and somebody punched somebody and get a black eye, I'm talking about brutal. People don't realize you get hit by a, a big man's fist, you break your jaw, your chin, knock you unconscious. He was considered the best in Memphis. He was tough. And so not long after he's back, he's arrested for attempted homicide. He happens to have a t-shirt on, blood, and he's holding a knife. And somehow, he beats those charges. But finally, the, city, the DA and the City of Memphis Police Department get him convicted for a string of sexual assaults. He receives a 10-year sentence. And in 1974, he's at the main prison out here. Well, in August of 1974, believe it or not, the parole board found that he had rehabilitated himself. And late that August, they turn him loose, release him onto the streets of Nashville. He does not go back to Memphis. He remains in Nashville, gets a little apartment, tiny little apartment. He shares it with another fellow over in North Nashville. In the fall of 1974, inmate 73179, is arrested trespassing on West End. He's arrested trespassing on Vanderbilt campus. He's arrested trans trespassing on a house out on Buena Vista Road in North Nashville. He's arrested out in Donaldson. Series of arrests. Guess what? Inmate 73179 never appears for any of the court appearances. Sarah Dupree in 1974, was a sophomore at Vanderbilt. She transferred from a college in Florida. Sweet girl, pretty girl, came from a good family. Her daddy was an outstanding physician at Vanderbilt University. They lived out on Estes, that you've just seen the, 
the maps on. They lived out there on Estes. And Sarah just moved to a new apartment. Well, it wasn't new. It was new for her, but it was an old building. It's what later became, for many of you know, the Boundary Nightclub that ran parallel over there near 21st. And Sarah had a third-story apartment. She also had a night job working in one of the girls' dorms at Vanderbilt. On February 1st, 1975, she had a date with a, a Vanderbilt student, Trammell Hudson. He was a member of SAE fraternity. They went to a movie, and you can't make this up. They went to a movie, Murder on the Orient Express. Then they go to an SAE party. They had a band. Y'all know how that is. It's, a lot of people dancing. gets really hot. Sarah had eaten something. She had a couple of drinks, and she got to feeling nauseated. She asked her date if he'd take her home. He did. And he pulls up and he says, Sarah, I'll be glad to walk you to your door. And she says, no, I'm fine. And Trammell Hudson watches Sarah walk up the steps to her apartment. The following Sunday, late Sunday evening, her father gets a phone call from Vanderbilt, from the dorm. And they said, where's Sarah? She's supposed to be here to work the front desk. It really troubled him. He said, I don't know. But he got in his car took his son with him, went to the apartment, went in and found Sarah murdered. She just had a blouse on. That's all she had. And there's Sarah. The homicide detective that... I'm going to move just a little. The homicide detective that worked it was an expert. He was one of the best we had. And he noted in his report no forcible entry. That's what he noted. And let me move on, but say, t tell you that a young detective that uh, Mr. Yarborough just mentioned, Diane Vaughn, was assigned to the Sarah Dupree case. Let's move on to February 12th. And late in the night, the midnight hour of February 12th, a Vanderbilt security officer is driving down West End going toward Nashville. And you remember back then, the last dorm on the right was a girl's dorm, right, right there at 21st and West End. He turns slowly as cruiser into the dorm, front parking lot, goes around to the back, looks and sees an intruder trying to break in one of the windows of the girl's dorm. He puts the light on him, gets out, arrests, arrests him. It's inmate 73179. And guess what? He doesn't appear at his court appearance. And by the way, 73179 is wearing a dark, long tweed overcoat. We move on to February 16th. Judy Porter is a senior at Belmont. She lives in Wright Hall. On a Saturday night, Judy stayed home and studied in the dorm in her room. She had a corner room, single room, no roommate. And it's real interesting most of the girls either came in early or just didn't go out and studied. So we had a, a dorm full of students, full of residents, with stereos on and laughing and cutting up. Judy Porter goes to sleep about 4 in the morning, feels a glove over her mouth and a knife to her neck. And he says very bluntly, if you move, I will kill you. He says some other things to her that General Thurman's going to tell you. Very consistent along the way. He brutally raped her repeatedly and then went into a rage when he discovered she had no cash. Just, just had a couple of dollars. Now, when you start talking about serious felonies, whether we're in Portland, Oregon, or whether in Miami, Florida, bad guys do their thing and then they leave. They don't hang around. This freaked the police out. The assailant stayed in her room over an hour. That's just unheard of. Diane Vaughn is assigned to the Judy Porter rape case. February 23rd, we had a young lady named Charlotte Chanson that lived down on Fairfax, just three doors up from 21st, y'all have all been along there. Her boyfriend is sick with the flu. 
and so one of Charlotte, Charlotte Shanson's friends takes her over and they see about her boyfriend and spend the night and they come back about four in the morning. It's raining. She's got her umbrella. That's going to be important. If she goes to unlock the front door, some, someone grabs her, puts the knife to her throat and says, I will kill you if you struggle. Charlotte struggled. She wouldn't have any of it. He cut her three times, but didn't hit the main artery or vein. He slammed her against a post, porch post. She happened to have her umbrella, and she rammed him. And I don't know if she surprised him or what, but he jumps off the porch and runs out into the dark. The assailant for Charlotte Ch Chatson was wearing a long, dark overcoat. You've heard about what the tragedy on February 25th, Marsha Trimble. Marie Maxwell was the last person other than the murderer to see Marsha. And Marie Maxwell testified that the tall, dark person, the adult, had a long, drab-colored overcoat on. Diana McMillan was recently married to Bobby McMillan. They lived on Fairfax, on, on Ackland Park. You've all been through there, up above the outback, up on top of the hill. There's a four-way stop up there. There's an old apartment still there. The building's still there. They lived in the top of it. Diana's husband, newlywed, Bobby, had a night job. So on Saturday, March 8th, Diana McMillan gets a phone call from her husband. It's late in the night. He says, can you come pick me up? They're going to let me off early tonight. And she says, sure. So she gets on her clothes, runs downstairs. They had a little carport where the, where the tenants parked their cars. And she's getting in the car, glove on the mouth, knife. And he had a gun too, excuse me. And said, come on, let's go. And he took her back upstairs, raped her, brutally raped her and assaulted her, stole her money. And then remember, remember Judy Porter, what we learned about he stayed over an hour? He says, where's your husband? And she said, well, he's coming home in about 30 minutes. The assailants just stayed there. And when her poor husband came home, he assaulted him and stole money from him. Long, dark, tweed overcoat. And General Thurman's going to say some of the things he said to these victims. Uh, Dan Vaughn is assigned... To the, Char to the Diana McMillan case. We're going to pick up the pace here now. March 12, 1975, Berry Hill. There's a Bransford Apartments out there. Judy Ladd, a young girl just like the others we've talked about, Judy Ladd was, was living with her boyfriend, police officer. Judy's about 8.30, 9 o'clock, her little dog starts barking, and they had sliding glass doors sort of on a patio in addition by the front door. She goes and opens up and looks out. It's raining, and she sees a tall, dark figure leaning against the wall. And I mean, it, it, she described it as creepy. She runs and gets her boyfriend's pistol, comes back, pulls open the curtain, and there he is. She holds up the gun. He turns around and runs up the hill, but he's not finished. She calls 911, whatever 911 was back then, calls the police. It's 1975, calls the police. The police department tells her to call the Berry Hill police. Great. She does, and a squad car happened to be out there, comes down, finds inmate 73179 trying to break in to the maintenance shed so he can get a tool and go down there and break into Judy Ladd's apartment even though he knows she has a gun. He's arrested. He's carried downtown. It turns out inmate 73179's name is Jerome Barrett. On Monday morning, let's talk just briefly about Diane Vaughn. And let me say this. Uh, our book, some of, the, some of the best reviews about our book was about our treatment of Diane Vaughn. Diane Vaughn came from a little place none of you ever heard of called Alpine, outside of Livingston, literally up in the mountains. She was a crackerjack basketball player for her high school, Overton County High School, but she was also a real good shot. 
with guns. She could handle guns. She attended Tennessee Tech for two years, but her real love, she wanted to be a police officer and for the Nashville Police Department. She was put on a waiting list. She worked at Bell South, South Central Bell back then, and finally was hired. And she's just what you would call a street cop. And let's talk a little, we talked about it in the book, let's talk a little about culture. Culture in a police department, our police department. If you were a lady, if you were a woman, it was tough. You could come in in the morning and open up your drawer and find condoms or a dildo. There would be groping going on. They would say nasty things to the women that worked in the police department. It was hard and it was a hostile environment. That's what we'd call it today. Dan Vaughn kept her mouth shut and did her job and slowly went up through the ranks. She finally, she finally was assigned the vice squad, she did her duties there, her business there. Let me tell you one quick story about our police department and Diane Vaughn. They used her as a decoy over in the roughest part of North Nashville. And at, at a certain time, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, they were going to pick her up. Guess what? They never, they never picked her up. And so Diane Vaughn didn't complain or anything, went on. Uh, so Dan Vaughn's assigned all these cases. The Monday after Ladd is arrested, I mean, uh, the Ladd incident, a detective comes and tells Dan Vaughn, you need to come down here and, and check this out. And he's referring to Jerome Barrett. Dan Vaughn gets busy after she learns about Jerome Barrett. And, the, and by the way, he had a dark, long tweed overcoat on. She gets busy and... She finds his address out, calls the landlord, gets permission. The landlord signs back then what you'd call a search consent order. Dan Vaughn and another officer go in, search his apartment, and find all the items from Judy Porter. She goes back, she brings him in, confronts him, and he admitted he raped Judy Porter. He said he didn't kill the other white girl. He said he didn't rape or attack Charlotte Jensen, but he killed... He did rape Judy Porter. They bring in the various victims we talked about. Every one of them identify them. Identify the long, dark tweed coat. Identify the weapons. And on March 17th, remember, Marsha takes place, the abduction, February 25th. March 17th, Diane Vaughn arrests Jerome Barrett for Judy Porter, Charlotte Chanson, and uh, Judy... Judy, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, all, Judy Ladd and Diane McMillan. So Diane Vaughn hits a home run. What we have is the Marsha Trimble case has just exploded and Diane Vaughn's assigned to uh, the Marsha Trimble case, but she gets the crummy evidence, the crummy jobs that nobody else wants. She's sent to Dyersburg to interview some crazy tip. She's sent all over the country. Nobody's interested. Uh, they're, they're telling me I got to speed on. I can talk about this all night. But we're going to fast forward to 1990, to 2007. The district attorney and the police chief create a cold case unit, Pat Postleon, and uh, that's a great on the same page. Pat Postleon, there's Pat, and Bill Pridemore run it. Pat's the lead officer. Pat asked Bill to start looking into the Dupree case. He starts looking in. They go out to the property room, Metro property room, and check out all the old files. Pride Moore sends Diane, uh, Sarah DePriest blouse and bed coverings back to the TBI to check for uh, whether well, they can do, work a profile up. And Pride Moore finds an affidavit in the bottom of it written by Diane Vaughn asking a judge to give her a search warrant to go to Jerome Barrett's and take hair samples. So suddenly, Jerome Barrett becomes the suspect for Bill Pridemore, Detective Pridemore. To make a long story short, they get permission. They go to Memphis. Barrett is released from the Judy Porter divorce uh, uh, sentence. He's 2002. He's released. They go to Memphis. They get a DNA swab from Barrett. They submit that. To make a long story even shorter, they get a call from the TBI that says, we've matched 
the profile in Dupree, and guess what? We have a cross match. So the same person that murdered Dupree murdered Tremble. Two weeks later, and I'm hushing, they're going to yank me down, but two weeks later, Pridemore gets a call and follow me. He gets a call, he says, come out to the TBI office. We want to talk to you. Bill thinks he's going to talk to some agent about one of his other cases. They take him in, and instead of going to this agent's office, they go upstairs into the director's big conference room. The director's, and, and, and it's full of agents. The director says, Pride Moore, Detective Pride Moore, we've got a match, we've got a profile match in Sarah Dupree. It, the profile matches Jerome Barrett, inmate 73179. And Pride Moore's stunned. He says, that's great. And the director says, no, 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 we're not through. We've also got a pro profile match in one of your other cases with Mr. Barrett, Marsha Tremble. John Siegenthaler said the Marsha Tremble case was the murder mystery case in the city of Nashville. And now I'm going to turn it over to General Thurman, who prosecuted that case.